I'm Nancy Levenger. I'm from Colorado State University and I'm here to tell you about. So, you have an interview. Now what? Uh, I've actually done this for a little while when I was a postdoc at the University of Minnesota. My uh, mentor, Pete Carr, helped me to figure out how to, how to prepare for an academic career. And one of the things that I started to think about was how do you interview for an academic job? And after I got my academic job, I was actually involved in a, a variety of workshops, both at the Eastern Analytical Symposium and then later in the, uh, at the ACS in the PHF program. And so maybe I know something about this. So here we go. So what happens before your interview? There's a whole bunch of things that are actually going on. And I'd like to be able to demystify this for you because it's not like we just say, we want to interview a faculty member, and then we call you up and interview you. There's a very, um, a very long uh, process that happens. The first thing that happens is we have to go and get permission to have a search. We have to convince the people in the higher uh, administration at our university that we need to be able to hire, and we have the resources to do so. That includes the money that it will cost for your research, but also the money that it costs for uh, your salary, that we have the resources to be able to do that. And after that, so maybe there's some course trading that goes on between my department chair and the dean and even the provost at the university, where we're deciding whether or not we have the ability to do this. Once we have permission to do that, then we form a search committee. The search committee is gonna have a few faculty members from our department, um, and usually somebody from outside our department just to keep it the balance and make sure that we're doing things in a, in a fashion that's appropriate for the university. It's kind of a, a, balance, a check and a balance there. The search committee does a lot of work. The first thing that they do is they write the ad for what, uh, what the position is. And um, that, will, that ad will then go to the whole faculty and the faculty have to vote on it and sometimes they don't like what the, vote, the, the ad is so they're trying to adjust it, but eventually that ad goes out. And these days it's great because these days those ads go out really, really fast. They're all online. It used to be that we would have to send things in to a paper version of Chemical Engineering News and then we would have to wait weeks and weeks before it actually showed up in the, in the uh, magazine and then we would have to wait weeks after that in order to be able to start the search. So now things actually move much more, um, more quickly because of the, um, the instantaneousness of, of uh, online ads. Once the position is advertised, we have to actually let it be up for a certain amount of time. Um, the university requires that we might have to have the ad show for at least three weeks so that people have enough time to be able to respond to that ad. And um, we also advertise in a number of different places. So we're very keen on being able to recruit people of, from di diverse backgrounds. So we'll look for places that will help us to potentially recruit people who are not, who don't just look like me. Well, I think they wouldn't mind hiring somebody who looked like me. So, um, and then we also, um, After the ad is um, advertised, um, we, the ad might have um, a, what we call a soft deadline. So sometimes we have a hard deadline. You, you'll see something that says, applications must be, must be uh, received by this date to be considered. Sometimes the ad will say something like, Ab uh, uh, applications received by October 15th will receive um, full consideration. And what that means is that we could actually still get applications that came in later, or if your application wasn't complete by that date, we can still consider it. That actually happens uh, more often than you would like to think about it, because usually one of the letters is late or something like that. So this gives you time to nudge people to get their letters in for you. Um, once the search deadline is reached, then the committee can start to screen the applications. Um, the committee can generally see all of the applications. Each committee member can see the applications as they come in and can start to read them, but they can't discuss these, um, um, the, position, the, the applications until after the um, deadline for the search, um, for 
for the applications to come in has passed. So they will have started to, to look at them. They will have started to screen them and look at and, and evaluate them and get an idea of what's in the in the um, group of applications, but they can't talk about them until after the deadline is passed. The other thing that has to happen is that at, um, I believe at all institutions, we have to have um, approval by the Office of Equal Opportunity to make sure that we have a diversity that matches what the field looks like. So that doesn't, in chemistry, we usually don't have a huge amount of diversity, but if we came up with a, uh, a slate of candidates who were all women, that would not be diverse enough. That would be an amazing thing to have happen. It would probably take it until, I don't know when, to actually happen. But it has happened that we have had searches where we got far too many applications just from white males, and the Office of Equal Opportunity said, no, it's not a diverse enough pool. It's not, doesn't follow the what the field looks like right now. And we have had to go back in and change things and solicit more applications in order to be able to do something. So then the search committee is going to screen the applications and make recommendations. How do they do the screen? The first screening is really easy. They go in and they see whether or not people have minimal, um, meet the minimal requirements for a position. Now, um, when the job market is really good, this is not that hard a thing, but when the job market is bad in the economy, you will be amazed who actually applies for a job to be a, a faculty member in chemistry. You'll get applications from people who have um, who are medical doctors and have been doctors for you know, a while and they think that because they have an MD they can come in and they can be a professor and they don't really have the background that we're looking for in terms of the applications. So that way we just screen out the people who don't qualify for the job. Um, the other thing that we do is that we oftentimes will go in and we'll do what we call a, a yes, no, maybe uh, poll of the, of the candidates. And that means that each search committee member quickly goes through and says, yes, this is a, a, a file that we really need to look at. No, I don't think that this is a file that we need to look at at all. It doesn't um, fit what we're, our needs are. It doesn't really have a well-developed idea about um, the research program. It's teaching statement says, I want to teach and nothing else. Um, you know, a, a minimal kind of a, a, a screening process there. If all of the committee's members say, and then there's a maybe that says, I'm not really sure, maybe this is one that we should look at. Minimally, if all of the faculty members on the search committee say no, that, that um, application gets taken out of the pool. And then there is, again, course training about you know how many are we going to do are we if two no's out of three is enough to be able to take out the, uh, the application some kind of a decision is made about that if you have a huge response to the number of faculty uh, of applications to the pool then uh, oftentimes you might have a more rigorous and a stringent um, requirement for the yes no maybe pool just because it makes less work for the search committee and they can really consider those yeses that are in the pool um, They'll screen the applications. Oftentimes, there'll be a rubric of some sort that we follow specifically in order to be able to make sure that we're being fair and um, we're giving the same amount of weight to each candidate in each area that they are, um, are being uh, engaged. And then the search committee will make a recommendation to the faculty. It'll be something like a, a long short list, maybe 10, 12 faculty, uh, candidates that um, are presented. And then all of the faculty members in the department can actually look at those um, applications. So if you apply to my university and I'm not on the search committee, the only way that I'm gonna be able to see your application is if the, the search committee recommends you to that long short list, or if you send me your application directly. Uh, then I might be able to um, nudge my colleagues who are on the search committee and say, hey, you should really take a look at Evan's application. It's right. The faculty will vote to interview a slate of candidates. Maybe they'll um, do a phone um, interview at this point in time in order to be able to do some screening as well at, um, for this. And once we have our slate of candidates, then we have to send that up again and say um, to the Office of Equal Opportunity and to the dean and to the provost, and they have to approve our ability to do the search then the search begins. Okay, usually, usually um, uh, an application or uh, an ad will, will 
will get us about 100 to 200 applications, but in a really bad year in the economy, we can have as many as four or 500. Um, and sometimes if we're trying to interview in a, if we've cast our net really narrowly, so we want to, you know, we want to hire an electrochemist, we won't get a very big pool and that won't really be able to give us enough people to make a, um, make a decent decision about it. So that might get scrapped or broadened after that. Um, we, as I said, we develop screening tools that um, allow us to see whether or not an applicant meets the minimum requirements. And of course, everything has to meet the um, diversity requirements. Okay, so now, let the interviews begin.